With us on the studio line, Ashok Gangadeen. He's a professor of philosophy at Haverford College in Pennsylvania, where he has taught for the past 35 years. He's an accomplished author, lecturer, and philosopher, with several books to his credit on global reason and the need for essential dialogue between worlds. He is the founder director of the Global Dialogue Institute, which cultivates common ground and supports the end of conflict and the future ahead. He hosts his own TV show called Philly Live, now Philadelphia, the city of my traditional career and roots and upbringing, and uh, maybe we'll get into that uh, somewhere along the line. And there's more to talk about. However, uh, that's all uh, coming up. It's time for a welcome, and he thanks for uh, Ashok joining us for a TRM dialogue today. So thanks, thanks. Alan, it's a pleasure to be with you. This is a wonderful venue, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, well, we, we talked off mic, about, uh, off mic about the need for... Uh, more media coverage of things, these things that we're about to talk about, and uh, we're both in that field, so maybe uh, collaborations are uh, down the line here. Yes. Uh, where, where to begin first? There's so much uh, to look at. Um, maybe uh, a brief thanks to our mutual friend Glenn Parry from the uh, Seed Graduate Institute for bringing us together through the yes. fifth annual Language of Spirituality Conference. We might do a PS to that in a moment, but... Um, let me, let me do this. Your abstract uh, for that conference is titled Awakening Deep Dialogue from Monologue to Dialogue. And I'd like to quote a part here and then ask you a question related to it. So it begins, Perhaps the single most powerful event facing humanity today is a great awakening on a planetary scale that has been millennia in the making. We humans are in the midst of a profound advance as a species to a higher form of global consciousness that has been emerging across cultures, religions, and worldviews through the centuries. This awakening of global consciousness is nothing less than a shift, a maturation from more egocentric patterns of life to a higher form of integral and dialogic patterns of life. Uh, now, I agree with that. And um, I, I uh, would, would like uh, to get some sense of what you say to someone who, someone who points to 9-11, uh, the Iraqi war, global terrorism, and conflict in so many countries, uh, that reflecting maybe an escalation of violence. And th that person might say further, we're not maturing, but regressing, we are breaking down and on the path to human extinction. So I, I, it's a tough question, but let's begin with that. It's a good question there, yeah, Alan. Yeah. It's one that I hear constantly because that is, uh, from a certain perspective, it's pretty obvious that we're surrounded by all sorts of almost escalating violence in the world. And uh, so it's, it's a good question to ask. How can anyone suggest that we are in the midst of an, an incredible awakening of spirituality and moving to a more global consciousness? So those need to be reconciled. And I think the most poignant way to do that is to realize that that's just the point. I mean, whatever we humans see is reflected in the lens of, of the mind that we use, the, 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 the consciousness and perspective that we're coming out of. And I think the great spiritual traditions uh, that I'm pointing to that you refer to in the abstract across the spectrum, all have seen that we humans are moving from a more egocentric way of being a human being. That means, egocentric means that when you're looking at the world, we're, we're raised in a certain worldview, we have a certain perspective, and most of us seem to be lodged in that perspective and see the world and every, the others and other worldviews from that perspective. That's a monocentric or an egocentric perspective when you see the world from your own lens. And what uh, the great spiritual teachers and teachings uh, across the board have all noticed is that there's a deeper way to be a human being that is more integral and holistic. And it takes you out of this monocentric lens and it gives a capacity to see and float and move with the deep interactivity of reality. And so the shift from the ego lens to the, I would call it the global lens, that has the capacity to see multiple worlds, gives a very different take on what's going on for everything around us. So imagine a person, someone like a Buddha or a Jesus or a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King or a Mandela, for example, who ostensibly are, are working from this more higher compassionate lens. They will see the world and events in a very different way than the ordinary ego person. And this is why, for example, Jesus uh, would, would teach this higher principle of love, which the ego person just doesn't understand. How do you love your enemy? Mm -hmm. And so forth. 
And I guess what I'm trying to bring out is that there's a deeper story to be told on a global scale when you look across these great traditions. There's a, a, a remarkable consensus and an astounding discovery that when we see the world from the, I would call it the logos lens, the global lens, when you can see it in, in this multiple kaleidoscopic way, you see a different story unfolding. And that's one of humans evolving into this more, you said, dialogic or integral holistic uh, capacity that we have, which is a place of compassion and love, the loving heart, the global heart. So if you look at 9-11, you look at the present uh, turbulence on the planet, only to see that in a more myopic ego lens is not going to give you the whole view. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm trying to bring out. And, and uh, so the, the, the more optimistic uh, scenario, if you could see that all of this makes sense as a painful shift, a traumatic shift, because evolution never happens easily. It always happens in the 11th hour, so to speak, when, when we're on the brink of a possible self-extinction, and the danger is very high, and the risks are great. So I think this is, this is uh, precisely a kind of scenario that, that uh, announces the possibility of the shift. <clears throat> On the other hand, when you look at the human situation, you, you've read the book about cultural creatives. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that begins to show an astounding uh, disclosure that there are many millions of people mm -hmm. who are spiritually inclined, who see themselves as spiritual beings, and who are ready for the shift in, in, in a new way to be a human being. Yeah. It's very interesting, Ashok, that you bring up uh, Paul Ray and, uh, and his wife who co-authored the book, um, C the Cultural Creatives. Right. Um, <clears throat> I know he recently reported at LOHAS, uh, Lifestyles of uh, Healthy People. It's a major organization, an offshoot of the Cultural Creatives, um, that uh, the economy ahead looked very turbulent, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. He was very frank about uh, things falling apart before maybe they're built up and uh, the old paradigms that are not based on some of the things that you're talking about, on the heart, on love, on spirituality, on sustainability, um, will, will collapse in some very uh, difficult ways in the next years ahead. I mean, we've We've heard, you know, many prophecies being related from the Hopi and other indigenous people to, um, you know, apocalypses predicted for uh, quite quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. Any sense of that, um, you know, from you or your your associates at uh, Haverford, the uh, professorial staff there, about um, the economics related to um, an egoic nature, uh, a collective egoic centric mind. Right. Well, I, I think that <clears throat> my, my sense is that uh, academic professors generally are not <clears throat> as attuned to these kinds of themes that you're talking about, so I don't find that kind of conversation here uh -huh. or in the academy in general. It's really with colleagues off campus out in the world <clears throat> who are really, uh, you know, who are concerned about the economic shift. For example, my colleague Irvin Laszlo, uh, who has written the book, the recently the connectivity hypothesis and megatrends and so forth. <clears throat> he 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 is looking at the global shift and he would think about economics. So if you look at Fritz of Capra and his uh, book about the turning and the holistic shift in paradigm, these these kinds of minds really see a different economic scenario. Again, it's not unlike the first question you asked about the looking at 9/11 from the ego lens or from the the, the, the global mind uh -huh. and, and seeing two different uh, you know events. Back to that for a moment, if you don't mind, Alan. Yes. If you look from the ego lens, you see this terrible, you know, collapse and tragic situation of the Twin Towers coming down. Uh -huh. uh, others uh, have seen that it was a global event, looking at the wider lens, that this, as tragic as it is and as catastrophic, is, <clears throat> is uh, a, a, a sign of a, a turning point in human history, a global event that almost signals the implosion and collapse of these Twin Towers rising which can be seen as uh, almost symbols of the old economic paradigm. Mm -hmm. And with them imploding, <clears throat> it, it signals a what next, what do we do next, so that it's seen as a global turning point. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of uh, e economics and, and uh, possible disaster scenes on the planet, I think you could look at it too. Is that there are those who are alarmist in a way, and end times people, who might read in a kind of a you know, fundamentalist biblical way, <clears throat> that there is going to be a tragic uh, collapse of the, of the whole system in some way. But if you look at the two lenses, what I'm hearing from friends uh, who and colleagues who are uh, uh, attuned to this great awakening 
on the planet is <clears throat> the awakening of a new consciousness always signals the end of an old. And it doesn't have to be the, the collapse, uh, the disastrous collapse. When, a, when an old paradigm or a worldview or a mindset gets left behind and becomes extinct and is dysfunctional, of course there's going to be turbulence. But the turbulence is a kind of a natural process of the fading and collapsing of an old way and the retooling of a new one. Mm -hmm. And I would rather see it that way, rather than as a physical breakdown of the, of the whole planetary system. It really is the end of an, uh, of, of an era, the end of a certain mentality. And I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great one that's in the offing now. I mean, if, if, if our human problems across the board are largely generated from ego-minding, from the, an ego way of processing reality and making ourselves in our world, <clears throat> then the shift out of ego minding into this integral, holistic, dialogic human being that can see himself, herself, and the other, and live from that, and can tap a deeper, I call it a logonomics, because I use the word logos for this deep, uh, you know, integral, unified field. Mm -hmm. If that's a logosphere, it's very different from the ego sphere. And so when you're in the ego sphere, you have egonomics. <laughs> economics driven by ego consciousness. Isn't that what we have now? I, That's I crescendo exactly right. with that. Yeah. That's what we have. And I think the signals is that, you know, there are healthy signs that there are corporate leaders who are visionary, maybe not enough, who see the need for a new way of doing business, a new bottom line. And yeah. I'm sure you're aware of them. Yeah, yeah. And so things are stirring on the planet that we need to have corporate responsibility and ethics in business uh, that takes account of the environment and human needs and human resources in a more respectful way. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, <clears throat> let me let me go back um, to your uh, abstract that you did for the seed conference and uh, read another highlighted section here that was interesting to me. It says, referring to a um, a crossing of species, um, kind of relating to what we've just talked about this 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 uh, integration into a global consciousness involving the co-creation of the common ground between worldviews, the fundamental logos, which is the source of diverse cultural and religious worldviews. Here it seems that the primary source of chronic violence and breakdown of human relations traces to egocentric patterns, which we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And the key to end violence mm -hmm. between cultures and advancing to global cultures of peace, nonviolence, mutual flourishing is our individual and collective advance as beings who live in patterns of deep dialogue. And, um, you know, I know the, uh, the global dialogue, the, uh, the spirituality of uh, uh, that, the, the conference that we talked about, the, the um, let me give you the, 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 what's the full name that they, it was the language of spirituality, okay, mm -hmm. which is about also global dialogue. Right. Uh, explain this practice of deep dialogue how it works, um, how it would work between two people, and, um, and how it might work with uh, a larger number of people, a community, which is more important maybe in creating uh, some unified field. Right, that's a great question. Okay. And, uh, it's a complex one. So let yeah. me start by just, yeah. again, going back to that point about the difference between being in the ego sphere, mm -hmm. the energy field uh, that's dominated by ego patterns of thought, yeah. and the logosphere. I use the word logos. I should clarify this. Yeah, the word logos comes from the Greek, mm -hmm. and it means speech. It means language, and uh, it means thought. It means reason. It has a wide range of meanings. It means what is first, fundamental. And when you look across a spectrum of different religious uh, worldviews and, and spirituality, you find that there has been a gravitation to something primal and first, whether it's called Tao in the Chinese or Om in the Hindu or uh, language or Shunyata, emptiness in the Buddhist tradition, or Allah, Yahweh, Christ, energy. There are many different names that have been given for this ultimate first uh, you know, ground of everything else. And, but there's been no common name, a global name, that would reveal that, look, there's got to be the same source because they're all pointing to the infinite word. And by the way, that word logos was picked up, uh, you know, in John in the Gospels, <clears throat> when he said, in effect, using the Greek, in the beginning is the logos, mm -hmm. and sees Jesus as a logos made flesh. So the word logos, uh, which means logic, it means reasoning, all of that is rich. And what I, what I uh, conjectured and did about uh, 20 years ago in my writings is uh, to help people see that there is a common deep field, a, a unified field, 
And I use the word logos for that. So whether you're, you, or you prefer to use the Om language or the Tao language or the Allah language or the, uh, uh, the language of science, speaking of energy and nature, it's, it's all different takes on the same fundamental logos. And if that's so, if there's a true fundamental common ground that's generating all of our worlds, then when we go back to the ego way of being a human, so if I'm a, a Muslim in an ego way, and a Christian in an ego way, and a Jew in an ego way, or a scientist in an ego way, I'm absolutizing my own language and my grammar, my lens. I'm treating that as the measure of all reality. And that leads to ego log, or what I call monologue. It's not real dialogue. Uh -huh. So deep dialogue, most people use the word dialogue loosely. And it means that I'm talking with you, you're, you're, you and I are having a dialogue, I tell you what I think, you tell me what you think, and that, that often is monologue. It means I'm interpreting you through my language and lens, you're interpreting me through yours. And if you are a Hindu and I'm a Christian, I'm taking your words in my, my, my lens. But deep dialogue is a word we use in my institute to help people understand real dialogue. Deep dialogue is when I step back from privileging my own lens and language and perspective and make some critical distance to step back from it and morph my mind into your way of seeing things so that I see the world profoundly differently. Mm. Most of us can't do that and don't do that. Yeah. And that's really why the division between worldviews can be so abysmal and, and violent and the breakdown of communication. So we, we're practicing the skill and art of deep dialogue, this capacity, which is part of critical thinking, to not take your own perspective as the only one in the absolute measure. And so you begin to become a dialogue being, a very different kind of being when you move from a being patterns of monologue to dialogue. Yeah. So, so when I'm speaking about yeah. a different species, imagine the human beings now maturing into this pattern of being dialogue beings, having the capacity to hold multiple perspectives together without watering them down. You want to respect their diversity, but also to find the common logos. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when sides break down, if it's pro-choice and pro-life, for yeah. example, you ask for an example, yeah. how would you apply a deep dialogue? Yeah. The pro-choice person is using the more, usually, the more ego uh, perspective, almost a fundamentalist way, as choice is the ultimate, this is the ultimate truth, and not able to see what the other person is saying. Mm -hmm. The pro-life person is saying, look, I come out of a biblical view, life is sacred, it involves a soul. To end a life is to, to commit a kind of murder, to terminate a life. I cannot abide that in good conscience. Abortion is murder. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you really hear that, you know, and, and that can be spoken in an ego voice too. And the person who is usually in the pro-life, uh, so to speak, uh, ego lens, is not able to see what the other person is saying about choice. Mm -hmm. and, and if either of them could really step back and get some deep dialogue going, so that imagine the pro-life pro person is able to step back and enter in to see what the pro-choice person is saying and begins to dilate and say, oh my God, I mean, what, what my friend just said is that choice is what our forefathers and mothers spilt their blood and sacrifice for for freedom. And choice is life. Yeah. And if I, if I give up my choice and let any institution compromise that and take that away, I'm giving up life itself. Yeah. Your words begin to expand. Yeah. Let's do this. You see what I mean? So yeah, the choice but, begins to be life. Yeah. Now, I, I want to continue on this uh, vein of thought, but we need to take a break here and come back and uh, continue our conversation. I'll just remind our listeners that we are talking with Ashok Gangadeen, who uh, is a, uh, a professor at, at um, professor of philosophy at Haverford College in Pennsylvania, and uh, he lectures around the country on dialogue and global dialogue and has founded the global dialogue institute we'll take a break here and come back and continue our conversation great we have returned with our featured guest today and we are talking uh, with ashok gangadeen in pennsylvania he's a professor of philosophy at harvard haverford college and uh, he's taught there for 35 years. You have a long tenure at that school. Yes, I've been here quite a while. And uh, doing some very good things in the uh, area of global dialogue uh, through the Global Dialogue Institute, which we're going to talk about uh, an organization that uh, you founded and direct that cultivates common ground and supports the end of conflict. And, you know, we can pick up on that and our last round of conversation, which... Um, you were pointing out about uh, egocentric nature and uh, that sometimes when we're in a conversation, 
it's not really even a dialogue, that there's like two monologues going on. Exactly. And I, I want to pick up on that, and if you would speak about uh, the dynamic of belief systems, which uh, we become, let's say, really attached to, and, and is a belief system really uh, part of our egoic nature that solidifies this place where we don't want to hear anything that is threatening to our belief system? And uh, then how do we break out of that? How do we get out of that egocentric uh, pattern? That you talk right. About? right, that's a good question. Yeah. The, the word belief and belief system in philosophy, you know, what do you believe? You believe certain thoughts. If you can just imagine um, uh, an ego, you know, a person, an I, having a screen, uh, uh, so to speak, of the mind that, that information pops up on, uh, philosophers call that, you know, propositions or statements or sentences. And if I, if I believe that rain is falling or grass is green or I'm a man or whatever it is, beliefs are part of a kind of information that I uh, subscribe to and, and, and hold at, at deep levels that is ingrained in us. So our beliefs are patterns of thoughts and holding on to thoughts at the visceral level all through our lives. And these beliefs reflect our worldview. So that if I believe that stones are just dead stuff, and that's been ingrained into me, or I was born and my life began when I was born and there was no prior life, or that I believe that time is linear and I'm going to die at the end of this uh, when my body collapses. These kinds of beliefs are are deeply ingrained and reflect a worldview. Uh So beliefs are part of a worldview. So when you say belief system, I think that's a kind of analog to a worldview. And a worldview is very deep for us. It's really our very life and blood. It's who we are. It's our identity. It's everything that we hold sacred so that we identify with our worldview. So that if, if I'm a scientist, for example, and I really deeply believe that the, the universe is material and that consciousness came later in the scene through some kind of accidental collision of, of molecules and subatomic energies that led to somehow the miracle of life and consciousness emerging from that, that's a very different belief system from someone who says coming out of a biblical tradition who really deeply believes that God is infinite spirit and God is the origin of the universe and God created the universe, let there be light, and that all of this universe is reflecting the, the creative force of this infinite consciousness so that this consciousness is holding all of this universe together. That places nature and matter in a very different light. That's a different belief system. Mm-hmm. I guess what I'm saying <clears throat> is that philosophers know that when you're in one belief system, what makes sense in one worldview often doesn't make sense in another. So, for example, when I arrived at Haverford, and um, an anthropologist who was working with the Bakongo culture uh, in, in, in Africa uh, came to me and said, look, Ashok, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as a European scientist, and we know it, that in science that nature is not conscious. We know that stones are dead. But when I go into the, into the village and speak to native speakers, it's quite clear for them that uh, this stone is a sacred site. This, this tree is a spirit. What do I do with that? That doesn't make sense in that belief system. And so I helped him to see that their conceptual ecology is arranged in a very different way. The lens that using their worldview opens a different reality than one that, that, that the scientist or the everyday person may be looking at. And so if you can really, as a scientist, enter into their conceptual ecology, so to speak, and begin to see the world differently, it will light up in a different way. So your point about beliefs uh, and belief systems and, 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 and the breakdown is beliefs run deep and they reflect our worldview and our worldview is who we are. And when you're in an ego way of being, you identify with that. And so when you hear a different worldview from a different source, it's profoundly threatening to your whole identity. Mm-hmm. And this is why people uh, go to war over their belief systems. And, and their belief systems around religion, too. I mean, that, that uh, being many holy wars. The irony of that, as I was suggesting earlier, is that the great spiritual traditions uh, recognize that, that everything in reality, all our meaning, and therefore all of our beliefs, should be shaped by the presence of the infinite spirit or the infinite word or the fundamental ultimate principle, by whatever name you call it. If you call it Allah, if you call it Yahweh, if you call it Christ, if you call it Om, if you call it Tao that they are all different takes on the same fundamental principle. So that when you fall into an ego way of being a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist, it really goes deeply against the grain of the higher scripture. And the great mystics have all seen that. The great mystics were ones who could move out of the ego lens and experience this logos 
presence and the, the common ground. And they've tried in so many different ways to express this to humanity, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the grammar, they didn't have the language. And this is what I'm working on. Yeah. My work has been to try and help us get the technology to articulate this logo space. Now, now you have chosen a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, acknowledging <clears throat> that uh, many of the masters who have experienced this unified field um, have come back with a teaching that, that, like the Tao, you mentioned the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one describing a state of um, enlightened ecstasy in some kind of unified field of light um, may not be able to explain that, and and yet yet this is what you and the institute <laughs> are attempting to do. So, right. ha, ha, maybe maybe uh, Ashok, maybe we can go to. Uh, uh, the seven stages of deep dialogue, critical thinking that you've developed mm -hmm. as um, I, 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 this is a tool, I guess, to, to develop. Yes, yes, it is. Let's Before talk we, about it. Yeah. You know, as we do that here, yeah. this might help because okay. as a teacher, imagine, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I went to India. I came back 30, 20, you know, 30 years ago now, 1972, I went to India. I was trained as a logician in the West and an ontologist on studying worldviews, and I hit some deep uh, polarities and oppositions I couldn't reconcile. And I was very uh, dis distraught as a philosopher because I only found opposition and polarity and no unity or integra integral uh, narrative. And I went to India and encountered the meditative teachings. And it really blew me away and turned everything around because for the first time in my education, I realized that these Eastern traditions saw that ego minding is a big problem. I didn't even have a word for it before. I just went ahead learning uh, the information and studying the different texts and so forth. So when I came back from India, I was turned around in a profound way because meditative thinking, meditative intelligence is a technology, uh, you know, that, that, it, that is meant to transform the mind and help everyday people get out of this ego into this profound unified integral awareness. That's what is going on in the Bhagavad Gita between Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna, this higher voice from the unified space, is instructing Arjuna step by step in a manual. This is how you let go of your ego, and this is how you go into the integral space. Uh -huh. So we have ancient technologies uh, across traditions to help give us manuals for that transformation. Uh -huh. And what I found as a teacher when I came back to Haverford is how do you teach a text like the Bhagavad Gita, which is a deep dialogue between the higher voice Krishna and the everyday ego person that's broken in the, on the battlefield, Arjuna, the warrior. And, and uh, how do you help students understand these two languages? So imagine this now, Alan. Yeah. I began to experiment using, I felt as a logician, you had to mark the voice of Krishna, or Jesus, or Buddha, or Lao Tzu, those who speak from this integral logosphere, with double brackets around anything they said to, sh to help the, the, the listener, the reader, the students realize, wow, they're speaking the integral language. And single brackets to mark when you're speaking from the ego. In other words, you could, if you could just picture that, that when you're, when you, to become aware that you're egoing and you're speaking from the ego vocabulary and language, like a technology of mind, let's mark it with a single bracket around everything you see, like a quotation marks. And when you're listening to the higher voice or speaking from the higher voice, use double brackets to integrate your speaking from holistic language, holistic space. That helps tremendously students and other people. Uh, to see, in the first place, there are two different dimensions of language. And if you don't disentangle them, you're going to get lost. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about deep dialogue, uh, deep dialogue is a pathway from the single bracket consciousness into the very difficult and challenging cha transformation into the double bracket awareness. And that's what I'm trying to chart out in the seven stages of deep dialogue that our institute uses. Now, uh, I was going to talk about meditation a little later, and I will. Uh, but I think it's a good a good time to bring it in, in into the conversation uh, as a tool also. We'll talk about these seven stages. Um, where does one's uh, kind of meditative, silent connection with the source of this uh, unified field outside of ego, how, how do you, and what's the tool to do that, you know? Well, I mean, the word meditation, you know, the, uh, you know, has been misused in many ways. Mm -hmm. people, people think you have to sit silently and chant Om and hold your fingers in a certain way and fold your legs and so forth. <clears throat> and that is a big, uh, you know, meditation is a form of awareness and, and, and mindfulness 
that should be going on in every moment of your life. And it's not, it can sound far away that, you know, you might say, I've never been to an ashram, I've never done yoga, I've never tried meditation, but it's a spontaneous thing that can happen. And uh, for example, I help my students who are very skeptical at first, said, Professor Gangadin, I can never achieve this kind of meditative intelligence and, and, and state of mind. Mm-hmm. And I try to help them see, you know, I ask them, have you ever as an athlete or a musician or, or engaged in whatever activity where you just got so lost in the activity that you just forgot yourself and you became one with the activity. Mm-hmm. And I talk about a runner, for example, who wants to be a, a brilliant, great runner across country, and she is being coached, and her coach is giving her all of this kind of ego information. This is how you breathe, this is how you lean, this is how you raise your, move your arms and, and develop your rhythms, raise your knees, knees and so forth. And she's practicing, you know, season after season from the ego perspective to be a great runner. And then one day, three years later, let's say, She's just running across country in the fall, in a beautiful nature setting, and suddenly she's lifted up into the running. Now she's in the double brackets. She is just running. She is the running. You can't say in the old language, I am running. It's just running am I. You, you are one with the running. And everything reaches at a kind of a meeting point in the flow of that experience. Yeah. And you can't use the old ego vocabulary to explain it anymore. You know that's not going to work. Yeah. And if you're a mystic and you're having that kind of experience, how do you explain it to the ego, you know, uh, audience? It's very hard. And the double brackets are an attempt to really tap what these great teachers, East, West, and other, have been saying when they spoke from this higher space, like Jesus. Uh, imagine what happened with Jesus. If Jesus is this Logos voice who is attempting to help humanity cross into a deeper covenant, a new covenant, a new way to to use our minds and, 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 and live the, the words we're speaking, if, if he was speaking from this deep space, double brackets, if he was a double brackets, and we downloaded him as ego people into the single brackets, there's a profound violence taking place in, in that way of, of, of uh, interpreting it. Hmm. And, and, and so, I mean, that you might, when Jesus would say, for those who have ears, let them hear, he realized that the audience has to develop new ears, new eyes, and new minds in order to process the kind of teaching he's, he's expressing. Yeah. So, right. so there's no doubt there's a lot of breakdown and turbulence from the ego uh, listener to the, to the integral speaker, you know, who might be say, speaking out of the scripture or the text. Right. All right, let's do this then. Uh, we will take one break here, if we can, and... Uh, and then continue. I want to, so we'll go through these seven stages of deep dialogue, critical thinking that you laid out right after we uh, take this break. That's great. Great. We have returned with our featured guest today, Ashoka Gangadeen, and uh, we are about to engage the seven stages of deep dialogue, critical thinking, uh, developed through the Global Dialogue Institute, which uh, Ashoka Gangadeen has uh, founded and is a director. Um, all this leading up to this about how one can, as you as you mentioned, uh, ha- have a different kind of perception or re- receipt of dialogue or conversation, uh, or feeling it from within and uh, reflecting uh, a unified field in one's uh, perception or conversation, a non-egoic state. This is this is so. Uh, is that what these seven stages are designed to create? Yes, they are. Okay. I mean, so you, you know, there are seven stages of deep dialogue, and it's good that in the last uh, you know, moments we spoke about you know, the, the challenges of moving from ego log to dialogue, you know, from the ego mind to the double bracket. So when I use the word uh, dialogue, I mean when your consciousness has moved into this deeper integral space where you can see yourself in the other. Mm-hmm. Buber called that the I-thou. And the, and the other ego spaces, when you see the other as an it, as an object, he called that the I-it. Mm-hmm. So different, different uh, you know, uh, teachers have seen these two ways of being, the I-it and the I-thou. And the meditative is important because I was pointing out that whether it's Buddha or, or Lao Tzu or, or the, the, the Krishna in the Gita, a meditative transformation is basically the move from this ego voice and ego way of being into this deeper, integral, holistic, uh, you know, uh, way. So meditative awakening is that the maturation. Mm-hmm. And so when I looked at all of these different texts and I saw that they were all teaching some kind of manual of how to move from one to the other, Jesus would say, unless you die, you cannot be born again. 
meaning you've got to lose the ego. You've got to step back from it. You've got to let it go. You've got to give it up and sacrifice it away uh, to, out of love of God in order to be freed from that entrapment in an ego belief about yourself in order to rise into the higher Christ consciousness. I mean, there are many ways of talking about this transformation. Mm -hmm. And about six, seven years ago, as I was trying to develop how do you teach deep dialogue transformation, I went into a kind of meditation where these seven stages just came right out. You know, and I'm just, I guess I'm just framing it by saying yeah. it's like a template of uh, across traditions of classical moves from the ego space where you're cut off to the awakened dialogue space. That's stage seven. Yeah, this, well, this is perfect for uh, integrating or uh, stimulating or catalyzing one's mind, uh, tricking it in a way, because um, it is a, it is a um, kind of a intellectual, quantitative system that is designed to melt everything away at the end, I guess. Uh, well, melt away the old rigid structures and bring us into a dynamic flow. Yeah. That's where you want to be in the seventh stage. You want to be a more mature, more moral being. Mm -hmm. You know, when the dialogic, when, when the deep, when the global heart and mind are activated, you're a being filled with compassion. You're flowing in the unified field where all things are dynamically interrelated. You don't see the other as a strange. You see yourself in the other as Jesus and Buddha were teaching, for example, and you see yourself in the environment, you see yourself in other creatures. So the moral law of have compassion for other beings and love your enemy as yourself and so forth, these injunctions of, of ethics is where ethics matures in the seventh stage. Do you want to just mention each stage and, and give a little just a synopsis of oh, it? Sure. Well, yeah. in the first stage, you imagine a person now who's at the brink of this breakthrough. I mean, she, he has been going through life, always reducing the other to uh, your own perspective and lens. You're more in a kind of a reductive mode. You've always been that way. You knew there were Buddhists out there and the Chinese people and African you know, perspectives and uh, Lakota, Native American. You've known that, but you've always taken it in your own lens. And you've reached the stage one is when the, the self faces the other for the first time in the realization, you know, wow, this, this other is a different worldview. I can't, be, I can't continue to just interpret it my way. Uh, there is another horizon here. Do I dare cross into this? It's so threatening. It feels such a risk to, to cross into that Lakota mind or this Chinese perspective or the, the Hindu mind. It's threatening everything I've ever been familiar with. So it's a kind of a scary radical encounter uh, encountering of difference that's stage one mm -hmm. the radical encountering of difference it's as if you realize there's difference here i can't i can't use my old ways of reducing it to my lens anymore what do i do i'm in a crisis do i draw back and say forget it or do i advance with a certain risk and try to enter this perspective and see it in a new way stage two is the person who has the the, the courage to say, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to enter this Lakota way of being and experience it now. It's kind of stage two is the crossing over, the letting go and the entering the world of this other. And so yourself becomes transformed through your new empathy. And for the first time, your, your eyes are being opened in a new way. You're seeing the world differently. If you're moving into the Hindu world, for example, you understand what prana is. You understand how deep karma runs. You understand samsara. You begin to see dharma. All of these, for, uh, you know, hitherto strange words that you were hearing in your culture, uh -huh. light up with a new meaning. And and when that happens, it's an incredible, uh, uh, you know, mind and heart opener because you're now seeing reality and yourself in a new context, in a new way, in a new ecology. Stage three is where you're you actually begin to experience yourself in this new way. That's where the uh, the self is transformed into this other. Uh, now that you're in, that, in the shoes of the other and in the eyes and mind and heart of the other. So stage three describes this new feeling of, of a new kind of home, a new way of being in reality, and goes in deeper depth into that. Stage four is you realize, well, who am I? What is my home? What is my identity? And so stage four describes, describes a very turbulent and difficult and challenging, challenging crossing back into, say, if you were a Christian before, and you went into Hindu perspective to experience it this way, you're coming home again, and you want to go back to your community. You want to go and revisit your former identity, but you realize that something has profoundly shifted because you're returning to your former community and identity with a new lens, with new knowledge, 
with a new awareness Mm -hmm. of a dialogue way that you didn't have before. And stage four describes the turbulence you have not only with yourself and your former identity, but with your colleagues and your family. Mm -hmm. And it can create a lot of turbulence there in terms of others being threatened by your new way of of seeing and being. And you go through that in some detail. I I remember... uh... We have returned with our featured guest today, and we're talking with Ashok Gangadeen. He's a writer, uh, an author. He is a lecturer, travels around the world. He is also the founder director of the Global Dialogue Institute, which cultivates a common ground, supports the end of conflict. He lives in my old hometown of Philadelphia, where he is a professor at Haverford College. And uh, we've already talked a lot. If anybody's just tuning in, uh, we invite them to backtrack and uh, request a copy of our interview here. Um, I, I want to go to something. Um, we finished the seven, uh, what you call the seven stages of deep dialogue and critical thinking. We went through stage one and one through seven with a brief description. Um, you mailed me a one-page summary of members of the World Commission on Global Consciousness and Spirituality. Yes. Um, how does that tie in with all this? Is that uh, an organization that Haverford has uh, uh, sponsored, or um, is it part of the Global Dialogue Institute? Um, well, that, yes, let's say it's definitely tied in. in okay. Fact, because when you're in this more... Uh, you know, global consciousness stage seven, and you find you're experiencing the interconnectivity of things and the meeting point of different worlds that at the, at the egocentric level are often warring and in, in violent relations, it really becomes imperative for the planet and the survival on the planet to help leaders around the world and the people at the grassroots, uh, you know, realize that how we're conducting our mind, uh, if, we're, if we're doing it in an ego, you know, adolescent way, is directly responsible for the disastrous uh, situations and problems and pathologies we're facing at the individual and corporate level. And so the birth of this idea of a world commission on global consciousness, it's a new kind of idea. It came out of a collective uh, you know, sentiment from a number of people. I, uh, in my work in the Global Dialogue Institute, uh, connecting with Professor Ewart Cousins at Fordham, who has been the editor of the World Spirituality Traditions, and he's one of our advisors and board members, uh, was in conversation with uh, Robert Mueller of the UN, who spent 35, 40 years in his career at the UN uh, as a peacemaker and uh, under sec- uh, undersecretary, uh, virtually next in line to become the secretary general of the, of the UN. So he has a great experience. He said that if in many commissions of the UN, or through the years in his experience, but never anyone on spirituality, and that it's high time on the planet, given the, the, the violence and breakdown of worldviews, mm-hmm. that we, we form a world commission. So he gave birth to the idea, and Karen Singh, a member of parliament, who has spent his brilliant career also in terms of interfaith dialogue and a leader there, and as a member of parliament and the last you know, uh, king, prince of Kashmir, and uh, virtually in line to be Prime Minister of India of that stature, he, the four of us, got together and said, let's uh, join and try, you know, with the Global Dialogue Institute being a kind of institutional base, and perhaps the University for Peace in Costa Rica being another one, to have multiple bases, begin to form a high-level commission of, of leading voices across diverse perspectives and fields, who all see the importance of the shift in the lens to global consciousness and spirituality as vital to addressing the, the urgent problems on the planet. Mm-hmm. So in 1998, at the World Congress of Philosophy in Boston, we launched this and, uh, and began brainstorming and inviting uh, a range of leading people through our consensus and consultation. And it began to grow that way. So the 20 names you see on the, on the list of commissioners uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama yeah. was keen, uh, keen on this idea and said that uh, he would fully lend his name and support to this kind of enterprise. Uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, uh-huh. at a later point, said he would. Uh, he really believes in this. Uh, we approached many other world leaders like Mandela and Elie Wiesel and many people not on the list who say they really believe in it, but they just are much too vi- busy 
mm-hmm. to, 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 to add any more. So they say, I support you. Please continue. So we got a lot of encouragement. Yeah, I mean, you got Hazel Henderson. Hazel uh, Henderson, uh, Jim Goodall, Bob Thurman, you know, Barbara Dewey Ming at Hubbard. Harvard, Barbara Marks Hubbard, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and these people have, have just been deeply committed to this idea. In fact, their own life work, if you look at Barbara Marks Hubbard uh, and Conscious Evolution and her work in building a communities uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, that are living in this new consciousness uh, of conscious evolution. She's a beautiful example mm-hmm. of of the kind of work that we're talking about. So it became clear that there's a growing community of leaders out there who have lived their lives trying to do this. And just by naming our, ourselves and co- collecting and convening ourselves uh, fulfills this kind of deep dialogue mentality of networking. So that there's almost an imperative in the seventh stage of moral awareness when you discover your interconnectivity and interdependence to come together a network. Mm-hmm. And we realize that something magnificent happens just by convening. Each of us becomes amplified by joining in common cause with the others. And I was just, just a week ago in a ret- retreat. We've been supported by the Brüninger Foundation in Germany, Helga Brüninger, who's a very aware and enlightened woman who's devoting all of her resources to helping uh, make this shift on the planet. Uh, and also, everyone sees it as absolutely urgent, has been supporting us, and they have a private island, Wasan Island, uh, you know, in the Moscow Lakes near Toronto, where we've held retreats for the World Commission. I just came back from the third uh, such retreat a week ago, where members of the commission would gather to to put our hearts and minds together to see how can we continue to build on this and address the crises on the planet. Uh, and we we came out this 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 past week with a proposal to form 15 wisdom councils hmm. uh, in different hot spots, uh, areas that the World Commission would would want to 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 uh, you know honor individuals who are doing this kind of work. For example, in the area of Islam and the West, and that dialogue post 9/11, we found about six, seven individuals, obviously, who are trying to show that Islam does not lead to violence. It is not terroristic. That you cannot, uh, you, 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 you must see in the deepest teachings of Islam the kind of uh, seventh stage that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, and uh, we're putting them on that wisdom council to unite and honor their work and to have them as a resource for the World Commission. We have leaders in conflict resolution. We have leaders in interreligious, interfaith dialogue. We have uh, leaders in uh, mindful media. This is another wisdom council, that the media. Yeah, this is uh, where I would like to participate with you, too. I think this is very important, very Absolutely. important. I think what you're doing, uh, Alan, is a good example of mindful media. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a global council on mindful media because the media is such a powerful influence and if it's dominated by egocentric uh, the patterns, it's just going to keep the people stuck. Yeah. And if it, if it begins to morph into a kind of enlightened uh, instrument of transformation, mindful media, it can be a powerful uh, medium to help uh, our cultures mature. Mm. And so we have about 15 different areas. In, in, integral health and healing is, is, is still another area. The, the, you know, the, the issues of concern to women and youth and uh, and uh, advancing and protecting them issues like the world earth charter and trying to bring an honor code for people across borders across the planet uh education how to renovate education in the 21st century we've got about seven or eight very powerful individuals who each in his her own way has been working to transform ed- the paradigm of education like Rian eisler and uh, jane goodall mm-hmm. and fred mednick out in the seattle area Teachers Beyond Borders, his, his organization. And just by, so we came out of this last retreat with about 100 individuals in these 15 wisdom councils in different areas, all of whom are doing the kind of work of a commission. And it was an enormous advance, mm-hmm. you know, to see the commission reaching out into the, across the planet this way. Is there a written report on this? I mean, do you... I'm, I'm now composing it as a co-convener. I am now writing up the report of this. I would love to see that. We, we do have a website uh-huh. know, that, uh, that people can begin. To use. It's still under construction. We're just putting it together. Our documents are going up. Okay, let's, uh, shall we give that out, or do you want to well, wait here? Well, we could. It's, it's www.globalspirit.org. Uh-huh. One word, globalspirit.org. 
And anyone who wants to see the seven stages of the work of the Global Dialogue Institute can go to www.global-dialogue, D-I-A-L-O-G-U-E, mm-hmm. dot com. And they can even see the seven stages written out there in one of the documents. Okay. And uh, so those are ways to follow up. All right. And uh, uh, what about your phone number? Do you give that out at the school? Well, yes. Yeah, you know, anyone who would like to communicate, try to reach me here at the, at the college, Haverford College, 610 Eight nine six ten thirty, or I can give my email address if they'd like to write me at a g a n g a d e at have 